his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mother chose. Everybody. Today is Aboriginal Sunday and Acknowledgement of Country. I would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people who are traditional custodians of the land. I would also like to pay respect to the elders both past and present of the Wiradjuri Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who may be present. Our service begins on page 119 of our prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sentence for the third Sunday after Epiphany. Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives. Together, the prayer of preparation. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 4, beginning at the 14th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. For the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Please sit down. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that the words of my mouth and indeed the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Can you think, can you think of a, an event that's changed your life? Or maybe a number of events? Circumstances? Different place you've been in? Marriage. <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> for the better or for the worse? <laughs> Uh, when I was a young man, I was growing up in idyllic conditions, really, in Sutherland Shire, um, or the Shire as they called it. It's the place where all the hobbits are, is, is that right? Uh, love life, love school, particularly the social side of things, the mates, Friday nights, out and about, you know what it's like. Parties, playing football on the weekends, going to the beach at Cronulla and helping with the surf patrols on the beach. All very lovely. Great, stable, happy family life. Things were great. It was heaven. It is true to say I never worried about much and really didn't think deeply about life, didn't have to. Well, things do change, though. Because life is not like that. I remember when I joined the New South Wales Police after leaving school at the ripe old age of 18 years and 11 months. It was time when I guess Things changed, the circumstances changed and things happened. It was a time when I guess that I grew up. The first time when I was personally and emotionally challenged about life. Seeing the hardness, the violence, the corruption at every level, level of society. Seeing evil played out in the lives of individuals on a level that is really hard to imagine. For the first time in my life, I actually encountered Aboriginal people and their culture. Living and growing up in the Shire, as they called it, I never encountered any Indigenous people. Didn't know any, didn't have any association with them. The only thing I knew about Aboriginal people was what was written in books by white people. So what I witnessed as a police officer shocked me. I saw in Redfern, in the inner city area of Sydney, in the 1970s, a culture that had been socially engineered by government policy of the day. Remember the Whitlam experiment of bringing people from other locations and placing them in one location in the city to be located away from their land, their country, in a hostile city environment. And this group were expected to be grateful and thrive in that environment. Nothing could be further from the truth. They lived like refugees and prisoners. The block, as it was called in Redfern, uh, I witnessed all the problems associated with people who had been removed from their land. They were oppressed and vilified, living in tragic social, economic and an alien environment, which had the effect of fostering unemployment, substance abuse, crime and a complete lack of self-worth. That was the outcome of government policy. Until then, living in the Shire, like most white Australians, I was blissfully unaware of any of this going on. For those Indigenous people relocated to Redfern, Australia was not the lucky country in any way, shape or form. My experience with Indigenous people continued throughout my ministry when I went into the priesthood as an Anglican vicar of Colerenabri in the Walgut Shire. Uh, we lived and worked with Aboriginal people. They had, a, um, they had a, a mission outside of town that they lived on the river bank. We would go there and do various services for them, church services, Meals on Wheels, and all the a variety of things that would happen in that. We had an op shop for them and many other things. Um, and so things certainly changed. But the sad thing is, I remember leaving there feeling, I don't know how much I've achieved. I don't know whether I've achieved anything at all uh, because of the desperate situation, even in that environment as well. Well, friends, why am I telling you this? Well, it's, this, today is, this Sunday is historically Aboriginal Sunday. Um, they moved it to the beginning of NAIDOC week for a while, 
and then we have COVID, and so they had to move it back because we didn't have NAIDOC week, if you can understand that. The, the history of it is that on the January 26th, Australia Day, 1938, Aboriginal leaders, including a person by the name of William Cooper, met for a day of mourning to seek equality and full citizenship. That was in 1938. And it only took them 30 years later to actually get to the point where that happened in 1968. Then William Cooper asked, in those days, the Australian church to set aside the Sunday before the 26th of January, which is Australia Day, as Aboriginal Sunday. Aboriginal Sunday is a day for Christians to act in solidarity with Aboriginal people and the injustices being experienced by them. It is a day for us to understand, to work on solutions together, to reconcile, to heal, to love, to care and to pray, which we do today. You know, I've come to the conclusion, you won't be surprised about this, but you know, I've come to the conclusion that the one standout solution for these issues is ultimately found in the coming of Christ into the world. Now, that's just not a throwaway line. In Luke's Gospel, the theme of that Gospel is that Jesus is the Saviour of the world. He is not the invention of the white culture. He is not he has not come into the world for the Jewish culture either. He is described as the saviour of the world throughout the Gospels. The reading we have today in Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 21 is the beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry. And here we have what, we, what commentators would call the Nazarene Manifesto. Basically, this is why he came. And he reads from the prophet Isaiah to do it. And he stands up and he goes to his own town. He's renowned throughout the place. But here, when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. So he turned up to church on the weekend every day, every Sunday, every Saturday. He stood up to read. And the scrolls of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, was given to him by the attendant. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. After that, he sits down and he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's happened. He came to his own town in Nazareth. The city of Nazareth in those days was a, a city, a regional city of 20, about 20,000 people. It was steeped in biblical history. We had Mount Carmel just out there. They had the Gideon battles over here. And they had all these things going on throughout biblical history all around them. If you stood on the hill in Nazareth and it was up on a rise, you could look across to the misty haze and see the blue of the Mediterranean Sea. Jesus is rostered to read and to expound the scriptures is what they did. The Old Testament scriptures were, were given to him and they were written on scrolls of animal hide of very soft thin leather. He would have read the passage in Hebrew and it would have been translated into Aramaic by an, an attendant who was a translator, because that was the popular language of the day. And so he reads from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It was a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, the Lord God. It is about the hope of salvation that the Messiah will bring to all people that the Messiah will come and meet every human need, is what it's saying. That the Messiah is anointed by God himself through the power of his spirit to do this. How good is that? Now the Jews, if you read on, rejected Jesus. 
Why did they do that? Well, he's a kid that's grown up in the town, you know, and all of a sudden he's up here telling us these things. They're easy to reject him then, but it's more than that. They rejected him because he was telling them that their message and the coming of the Messiah is not exclusively theirs. That they are the chosen people, they should have it and no one else should have it. And he's saying to them, not so. That all people are equally included in the great hope of the coming of the Messiah. Everyone on the face of the planet. That all people are equal in the sight of God. Jesus, as he read from the prophet Isaiah, he said, the Messiah would come and bring good news to the poor. Did he mean the economically poor? Well, he probably did. And the underprivileged? But it was more than that. It was the spiritually impoverished that he was talking about as well. Those who seek, wait, search for God, those who seek God will find him. No matter who you are, they will be satisfied. And of course this echoes the Beatitudes, does it not? When he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Without God in our lives, we are spiritually bankrupt spiritually bankrupt. The gospel message of the coming of Jesus tells us that we will be spiritually rich if we believe in Jesus. The next part of the manifesto was he sent me to proclaim release to the captives, those who are oppressed by others, not necessarily in jail, but it could be. But those who feel imprisoned by their own life, we can feel imprisoned by the things around us in our own life. By the circumstances of life, we can be imprisoned and captive. Even those um, who have been imprisoned because of what's happened in their circumstances of their own personal imprisonment. The alternative to all of this, Jesus says, that he has come. When we turn to Christ, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter where you have been born, or what cultural background you are from, Jesus said here that God is accessible to all people. No one is excluded from the love of God in Christ Jesus, we're told by Paul. Part of the other part of this manifesto was that he's come to give sight to the blind. Is it blind Bartimaeus? Is it physical sight? Well, yes, it could be. But Jesus didn't come to be just a worker of miracles, of magical tricks or anything like that. Jesus came into the world to illuminate the world with the good news of Christ and his coming. A world where we live in dark places at times. And we do. And we stumble around in those dark places. And we get lost in those dark places. We do not know where we are going or where we are heading at times. No purpose or direction. We just simply exist until we die. Not good enough. If you are in a dark place, or if you can see no light or life, or if you feel that you have no future or despair, that's what Jesus has come for. Remember the Manning Clark, that great historian from Sydney University, who talked about living and being born into a fog. And we live in a fog and we stumble around and we trip over things because we can't see clearly what's going on in behind us or in front of us. And all of a sudden the penny drops and the fog dissipates and we can see clearly. And that's what Jesus is on about here. Ultimately, when we're in a dark place, and when we occupy that dark place, Christ can come into our life and illuminate our life. Because Jesus is described in the Bible as the light of the world, the one who does illuminate when we are in darkness. And friends, we're all like that. We're all corporately like that. Emotionally and spiritually, we can be like that. The next thing about this manifesto is it says, he will release the captives. To understand what true freedom is, is not only being released from captivity or prison, 
It means being released from the constraints that hold us back, that debilitate our progress, that nail us down and we cannot get out of it. Being released from our own selfishness and our own pride and our own arrogance. We're captivity to those things. That's what it's about. I remember when I was the rector of, um, or the vicar, as they called him in those days, of Collar Enterbry, up in the Walgett Shire. I had a church warden by the name of Bobby Williams. Bobby had clay feet like all of us, but he was a proud Aboriginal man. I saw in his life the transforming power of God and his family's life. It was very interesting that Bobby was a man who was never out of a job. And one of the job that he did have was he would dig fence posts. He'd make them and dig holes and put fence posts in. There are a lot of fence posts in Colorado Bry and the Walgett Shire. And that's what he did from sunrise to sunset. So it was a tough environment. He didn't drink alcohol. And in many ways, he was a beacon, not only to our community, but to the indigenous community as well. You see the transforming power of God in people's lives. He had an Aboriginal Bible study and he would work tirelessly with the Aboriginal people. And he was vilified for that as well. Jesus has proclaimed in this synagogue in Nazareth that the Messiah has now arrived onto the stage of world history. And the beautiful thing about his incarnation is he came in for the whole world, not just a select group, not just one culture or race. All of us have access to Jesus as Lord. Everyone on the face of the planet. We are loved by God, all of us, and valued by God, all of us. He sees us as his beautiful creation. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, remember in that famous speech that he said he had a dream that his four little children will grow up not being judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. God brings that into our lives. After Jesus finished reading from the prophet Isaiah, he sat down. Uh, it was the position of a teacher. Teachers sat down in those days to teach. And he preached probably the most powerful and shortest sermon you could hear, not unlike the ones you hear today up here, but a very short one. And he said, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That was it. All of this is now a reality. This, friends, is the good news, no, the great news we have to share. It is a gospel, it's a message for every nation on the face of this planet for every cultural group, for every person, irrespective of their circumstances in life. You see, while us humans might discriminate and constantly look for difference and constantly criticise people who are different, God does not do that. Everyone on the face of this planet are loved and, and, and are equal in his sight. God believes and sees the solidarity of humanity under God, that we are all the same. We are all unique godlike creatures created in his image after his own likeness. There's a message we really need to take on board as we go out there and as we live with our prejudices, our discrimination and all these things that drive wedges between people. God is not like that. So let us go out there triumphantly today, thinking about the solidarity of humanity under God. And may God bless and keep us as we do that together. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed. From the grace that I found in you, Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love.
Let me see you face to face the knowledge of your love as you live in. Spirit leads me on. 